Okay, so um, one of the things we've been working on in Builder is isolating different components from each other in case they crash because uh, one of the problems we have is with developer tooling is that, um, you know, we tend to write programs just well enough to work for ourselves and uh, in, in the process of that, you know, you don't want to have these tools take down the rest of your editing environment. But it's also useful for a security model uh, and you might be familiar with it, uh, it was really pioneered by Google Chrome, the web browser, in isolating all of these different sections of a web browser uh, to protect against like untrusted data attacks and other uh, malicious data on the internet. So the, the idea is that you have uh, some component of your system isolated from the others and there's only a certain way for them to communicate and by doing that you have a very small surface area to uh, protect, to like um, really harden in your processes. And there's a couple ways you can do this. Right now, uh, there's, there's basically two primary ways we can do it on Linux. There's a new project from Google called Sandboxed API. And it's kind of pioneering through library linking the ability to automatically generate uh, a shim that will take your API call from a function and call it into another process that's hosting just that code and keep them separate. So if you can, you think about like how we could implement this on the GNOME technology stack with geobject introspection where we know we have this description of all of the code we have in there and maybe we look at how we would call that function and instead of calling it locally we could shoot that off to another process. It's not portable currently because it requires specific linker hooks on, uh, on basically the library linker loader that we have on Linux and you also need to be careful to avoid unsupported functionality. For example, if you need to pass file descriptors between functions, that's going to be somewhat problematic because it doesn't know how to take this simple integer and send it across the wire to be available in the other process. But the other model that's very popular everywhere else is the use of sub-processes. And so if we take this as a, a fundamental requirement that if we're going to do sandboxing, we need to work with sub-processes to isolate, then uh, we can create some abstractions that allow us to support this on different platforms. But I'm going to focus on Linux today because that's what I know. Uh, but we can abstract some things. Okay, so to do a sandbox subprocess, we kind of follow the normal subprocess execution model where we fork, create a second version of our, pro our process space and then normally you would execute your subprocess in that secondary process space. Uh, after you fork, but before you exec, you might need to set up your communication pipes to be able to synchronize data between the subprocesses. The other step is you need to reduce your privileges. So the idea with these sandboxing technologies is that you start the process space, you remove everything you don't need, and then you continue executing uh, the rest of your uh, uh, worker process. In our case on Linux, we have a, many options. We have setcomp, which will allow you to reduce what uh, system calls your process can make. We have on, uh, I believe it's OpenBSD, the pledge syscall, which allows you to do some somewhat similar thing, but with um, API calls. And then on Linux, we also have a number of namespaces we can use. So we can restrict uh, what processes your uh, sandbox process can see, we can reduce whether or not it has network access, which might be useful. For example, a image decoder probably doesn't need network access. So if you allowed an image decoder to have network access and someone exploited your image decoder, they might be able to download code from the internet and start executing it, right? So that might be a surface area you want to protect against. So if you can start one of these sandboxes that just does image decoding into a frame buffer, uh, you might just give that one access to uh, files, if even that. It might just be a purely code executing subprocess. Remove network, remove all the other communication primitives from it. But then after you've done all this setup, you exec the subprocess as normal. However, uh, on our platform, we might be able to do this a little bit uh, higher level. And the reason for that is to set up sandboxes, it usually requires a certain level of uh, like privileges. 
And so if we have a sandbox process that's our UI application, for example, a flat packed process, that process doesn't have enough privileges already from the beginning to be able to create new sandboxes beneath it. So uh, if we look at the second one here, uh, in this case we have a flat pack spawn helper that knows how to go and talk to the flat pack desktop service and be able to create a new sandbox on our behalf. And it can do this because it knows that it's our process talking to, this, uh, to the helper so it can do this safely. If you're running on a host system, uh, maybe you're writing a particular program that doesn't, can't be sandboxed or whatnot, or maybe it's a portal helper, you could use bubble wrap directly. And bubble wrap is a tool that allows us to remove features from a sandbox and execute them, uh, execute a particular program. I believe we use this in a couple spaces uh, for doing like system thumbnailing. We, we don't necessarily want to give the thumbnailer access to the whole system. So we can run the thumbnailer code inside of bubble wrap and it can remove pri privileges and then execute just the thumbnailer. Uh, bubble wrap also helps with systems that don't support user namespaces. And user namespaces allow you to create like a new container namespace without being root. And some systems historically have not enabled that code because there's been lots of security vulnerabilities in it. So on those older systems, uh, or systems that don't have that enabled, you can use a SUID process, which Bubble Wrap supports, and it can handle all of that uh, security setup for you. And then the Flatback Debug service is basically a wrapper around Bubble Wrap for us that does all of this checking to make sure that you're able to do this safely. Uh, so one of the other things that uh, would be nice in terms, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more in design in the, f in the future, but the ability to have Generally, your containerized process in, flat, in the Flatpak case is your UI process. And your UI process may not want to have, you may actually want to have different privileges in the UI process from one of your worker processes. So if you're gonna do a web browser, for example, you may not want the UI process to have access to the network, but you may want a sub-process that's doing TLS and other network security crypto code talking to the peer services, you, that one may want to have network access. And the idea is that every process that you create should have as little privileges as it's necessary to run. And doing so helps reduce your attack surface and prevent um, uh, any particular exploited code from attacking the other layers. But also the above is all just Linux only, so if you have the intent to support BSDs or Windows, Mac OS, et cetera, in your platform, it's good to abstract how you spawn your processes so that you can put in the proper hooks for those platforms. And I'm not expert on those platforms, so I won't tell you how to do that, but the APIs mostly exist to set the stuff up and you'll have to do some of your own research. So in the process of doing this, we have to come up with how are we gonna start separating our processes? So it's always gonna be application specific. There's no like simple answer for this. But uh, depending on your, sa your attack surface, uh, you may want to either have very small programs that do just a very specific thing, or you may want to have a larger program that has the code to execute all the different modes of your sandbox process, and then just have the single binary executed different ways. The, I believe the Google Chrome mode uses a single like Chrome library or a Chrome program and then just executes it with different types. So if you see here, let's see if I can, oops, no I can't select. But if you see here with like the dash dash type equals GPU or et cetera, you might just have the single program that runs like that. That's how Builder used to work, uh, but in more modern I found it easier to remove all of that code from the helper processes because it made them a little bit smaller, it made it easier to like fuzz and test them. So in terms of untrusted data, this is one area that we haven't really done well historically. If you think about like opening a file in a program like a Word document, LibreOffice, writer document, et cetera, uh, we sort of just kind of load those file formats in the UI process and hope that we don't corrupt memory, et cetera. And if we do, it has the potential to take on the whole process. This is a great place where you can start segmenting your uh, 
your parsing of user, untrusted user data. For example, you might have a file format plugin that is implementing reading open office document format and put it into a sub process with no access to external files, no access to network, et cetera. And then when the user opens a file, you can, they select the file, Flatpak could give us a file descriptor for that file, and then you pass that into your worker process. That worker process can go and decode that file format and can return a parse structure back to the host process. In this case now, even if that subprocess crashes, the UI process can handle that gracefully. If it gets attacked, if there's uh, code execution vulnerabilities, vulnerable, I can't even talk right now, vulnerabilities, uh, then it's isolated to that section. It doesn't have access to network, it doesn't access, have access to your file storage. The worst it can do is corrupt the file descriptor that was given into it. Uh, in this case, uh, and, and in most of those cases, we don't actually give it the real file descriptor of the file on disk. We give it a, an indirect file that we can control. For passing data structures back to the UI process, I usually use gvariant for this. And the reason for that is it's a really convenient format that can be recursive in nature. You can have these really complex structures of structures of structures. And it doesn't take a whole lot of parsing to validate that the format is correct and it's flexible in uh, accessing the data in memory without having to make copies everywhere. Uh, you can use pretty much anything you want, but I just suggest that you stick with the serialization format and use it consistently. Some other areas to think about in terms of how you might want to segment things. Uh, the network connections, you can think about, you know, you may, if you were really paranoid, you may want to separate the connecting to services, connecting to servers, into one subprocess and keep crypto code in another process. So if you know you're going to be talking TLS to a particular process, you may want to uh, connect to the socket in one and then pass that to another process that does uh, the actual crypto code. Image decoding, you know, we've had tons of uh, CVEs for that over the years. That's another thing that's great to move. Uh, decompression, like bzip, gzip, et cetera. And then uh, CPUs for, I think of virtual machines in general. Excuse me. <coughs> virtual CPUs in general, so like a game emulator, in most cases that's emulating some sort of CPU from like some embedded uh, video game console. But also virtual machines, say if you're running like Lua JIT, et cetera. And then proprietary libraries, if uh, I think of that in terms of like video codecs. And if you do this all, if you think about like the, the file format loading and parsing and you can push that off into a secondary process, that makes it a lot easier to fuzz it. And that's generally because the fuzzing tooling out there by the security industry is often program based. You'll say, here's a file and that you should process with this program and continually modify the input file until you can make the program crash. So if you're already building things this way, it's basically the same problem as setting it up for fuzzing. So once you have all of this set up, it's not really helpful to have all of these subprocesses unless they can communicate with each other. So in this case, uh, like I said earlier, avoid these, like making up your own serialization formats. It's really just another source of bugs that other people aren't fixing for you. But uh, as I said, I use gvariant. The G, uh, the Google RPC, I spelled that wrong there, but thrift, JSON RPC, et cetera, all fine formats. Although I would suggest that you use a format that al allows for events or signals. And that is just because of how we write our software in GNOME is generally G object base has signals and stuff. Uh, and in doing that, you need, you basically need support for out of order replies. And by that I mean like, if I call one RPC in the other process, and then call a second RPC in that process, I don't want the second RPC to be blocked on the first one finishing before I get the second one back. Uh, some RPC formats out there do have a requirement that that happens. And if you do that, you need to start dealing with your own command queuing on both sides. So 
you know, generally I would just say use the dbus serialization format over your communication format and that's basically G, the dbus serialization format is basically gvariant. Um, also, if you use the dbus serialization format, you get this other feature which is great and that's passing file descriptors. And you might want to do that in the case of image decoding because when you need an image decoded, you know the size you want it to be decoded to and you know the color format you want it to be decoded to. So if you know those two things, you can calculate the size of the memory buffer you need for the image and you can just say, here's a file descriptor to decode this image and let the worker process decode the image into that space after which the operation's done, you can now load that and draw it in your library without ever having to dereference pointers or anything exotic. You're just working with a plain frame buffer. So that can remove a, a huge potential for uh, code execution vulnerabilities simply by not having any pointer chasing in the UI process. I guess so for the communication model, you can use pretty much any communication system you can think of. That could be shared memory with coordinated message spaces. It could be pipes or sockets. I usually use standard in, standard out, but you do need to be careful about whether or not you use printf in your worker processes if you're going to do that. Um, but uh, having the bidirectional communication is great so that you get uh, those events and uh, message replies and whatnot. If you really care about performance, you might want to use Futex over shared memory regions, but the more complex that you do that, I mean, you're gonna make it harder to fuzz and whatnot too, and it's just really difficult to debug uh, Futexes, so. So here we have an example in Builder. We isolated Git from the Builder process. Most of the IDEs out there are just using the Git library in the UI process. And I did it for a lot of reasons. One, because libgit will often link against OpenSSL on some distributions and it's license incompatible, but you also have the situation where users want to know where is like all my memory being taken or why is Builder taking 800 megs of memory when 600 megs of that is coming from loading the Git repository. So I wanted better visibility, I wanted isolation of the libgit to process, license compatibility, et cetera. And so in here we have all of the code implementing the worker process is in this GNOME Builder plugin git file and then we have an easy way to test that from the command line and then fuzz it later on. So if we go here, let's see here. Here is like a, this is a test hook program that is uh, instrumenting the worker process that we use in Builder, connecting over to remote server, running cloning, and uh, in a second here if the Wi-Fi has enough gigabits, we can, well, that might take a minute, we'll just switch. Um, but it can, oh, there we go. So this one's testing crypto signing as well. And everything executes. So uh, this is a sub-process, I'm able to test it and prove that it's working without having to load up all of Builder and try to like set up the UI in such a way that we actually execute things. Uh, so I find that very handy. You can run it as your automated test. You can run it in CI, et cetera. Uh, and then we wrap the whole thing through this client object in Builder, which makes it very convenient from Builder. It just sees this as like a service. So if you're used to writing like uh, all these like microarchitecture service systems, it's basically the same thing. You just have this like git client, tell it what to do, that communicates over to the subprocess and gets a response back, et cetera. So as I mentioned, the file descriptors is really handy. Uh, one reason to use memfds to pass data back and forth is you can seal them. So if you wanted to protect any arbitrary rights to some data you decoded, uh, you can, like you imagine one of the attacks that people often do is they'll use an attack in some code to write data to another area so it gets interpreted differently. Uh, so if you decode your data into a memfd, and then you seal that memfd, you can avoid the program ever being able to write to that memory region. So that can be helpful in hardening your program from other code attacking data you've safely decoded. Um, if you use structs in your decoded data, that's also really handy because your structs may have data that you want to use to reference other data at particular offsets. And if 
let's say you needed, let's say you had an array of 10 structs and one of them told you what the position of another struct that data is and it was seven. But someone overwrote data and made it 11, you now have to parse that data every time to make sure that it's not out of bounds. Whereas if you validate it up front and you seal the memory space, you can trust that it's there, you can keep your code fast and also ensure that it's safe. Another nice thing about using FDs is, and passing them between processes, is you could have a dedicated storage process. And that storage process could give you a file descriptor back of some content you have, and then you could pass that across to a network process. And you can avoid copying the memory around. So if you have like a really big file that you would want to upload, you won't want to move that between processes and copy all of that memory, but instead you could just open a file descriptor, load it in one zone, and then pass it to the other zone, the other zone can do with it as it needs. And that's basically how these things are working. I have one more demo we can show here as well. This is Clang isolated from Builder. I know we had a lot of crashes for people that were writing C and C++ code in the early days of Builder and it was largely because we brought Clang into process. And most compilers are, uh, it's a very difficult problem space and they often are quite crashy and leak memory. So one of the things we did to bring that memory process overhead down on Builder was to uh, isolate Clang out and then as it starts to get unruly we just kill the process and restart it. So in this case I can test the Clang stuff, I can be sure that it works when people have issues with Clang and Builder and it doesn't affect, I don't have to again load their project into Builder, I can just reuse this stuff easily. Um, so that's kind of the high level overview of how we're sep doing process separation. Does anyone have any questions or curious about how they can move forward making their application uh, contextually secure fashion. So the, the one question that I would have is, is there any way that this all could be made easier? Like moving some of the, the helper functions maybe for a very specific problem type into somewhere like glib? Yeah, I mean, I would very much like that in particular with, um, I mean, something I would like is instead of just a G sub process launcher, having either APIs on, extension APIs on that or like a G container interface of some sort that allows us to restrict privileges. But the difficulty is really portability. I think that starting small, you know, maybe something that just blocks a couple of syscalls and maybe not, you know, full-fledged uh, sandboxing from within a sandbox. But um, simply having something that uses pledge on BSDs and using, uh, uses some, uh, some Linux functions like seccomp and whatever else on Linux and maybe say the rest is unimplemented. Uh, mm -hmm just to have something to start with, something that maybe a, a couple of projects could use. Do you imagine something like the thumbnailer service? Because that's, I know we use bubble wrap there directly today. I would think that that maybe is a potential. Mm -hmm. I, it, my point is basically like, can we get a, a use case so we know we implement it correctly? Right, uh, I can imagine something, something fairly simple uh, that could be used for example in, in media indexes. Mm -hmm. So that would mean tracker, uh, Rhythmbox has got a media, its own media indexer as well. Just having, uh, being able to pass a file and get back metadata would be, uh, if the API allowed that, that would allow uh, an awful lot of things already to start right. with. And then, you know, maybe increase the, uh, the feature set on the API or something like that. But uh, at least having, uh, I think that having, uh, an API in glib that can be extended. Uh, just having an API that can be extended upon uh, would be great. Cool. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think that's possible. Uh, well, I think the danger here is, uh, well, I am continuing to answer the question. Uh, 
the danger here is uh, creating some API that is uh, bad, that abstracts some bad ideas. For example, there is a lot of uh, criticism about uh, SECOMP uh, regarding the fact that uh, restricting uh, raw system calls is not necessarily, necessarily a bad idea because it's not your application that makes those system calls. It's some library uh, that makes them for you, and a new version uh, can try making other system calls. So it's uh, restriction on that layer is very fragile, so we really need uh, uh, to make sure that we know what, uh, uh, what is the desired end result before implementing anything. Otherwise, we will just repeat the second mistake uh, that is, for example, heavily criticized by OpenBSD guys. No worries. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it, it would be nice to have something that could work everywhere. I, I guess at this point, figuring out what syscalls we can use are going to be, uh, you're going to have to run strace or something, I guess. Any others? This one works now. Uh, do you have some rules of thumb for things like uh, when is it more appropriate to use just la, just a socket or a pipe to communicate with the with the helper processes versus uh, shared memory? I've been having the doubt on passing large blocks of data, uh, but maybe that's because I was used to pipes and stuff being slower than shared memory, but maybe it's not a big deal these days. So For example, l l I'm specifically thinking of uh, sandboxing I SVG decoding. I do think, um, well one, I would say actually I would not recommend that anyone use a shared memory and few text to pass things because you know, the, the bugs that come with that are very, very difficult to track down. And unless you're writing a database, I don't think you're going to get much benefit from it, at least on modern architectures. Uh, the value of using socket and pipe as your base layer is that you can do a send message and pass a file descriptor over it. So if you have anything large to send across it, and I think the Leonard years ago did a test and it was basically anything under half a megabyte is faster to copy. Um, and so, you know, think about like, I guess, how big your, your expected data set's gonna be and whether or not it can become outrageous. Uh, but even if it was, instead, you can just put that in a memfd or tempfs file and then pass the file descriptor across. And that also allows you to map the data on both sides too, so that may be advantageous. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would just say use Piper socket and then for anything large, pass it as a file descriptor. Thanks. Cool. I think we are out of time, so. Thank you, Christian. Bye.